Hey, yo, everybody. Zach Gord's here with RevZilla, joined as always by my buddy Spurgeon Dunbar. This is High Side, Low Side, Season 6, Episode 1. Coming at you this time around, a new section we like to call Not the News. We'll explain that later on. A discussion of how many bikes in the garage is too many. That'll be with our good friend, Patrick Garvin from JMP Cycles. We also have a uh, fun little engine guessing game we hope you like. Um, that'll be with Patrick as well. And of course, we're going to give away a t-shirt because we still have two flipping many of them lying around. And last but not least, we will address a couple of viewer, listener comments and questions. Fun little note about the two this time around, both from Europe. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> Before we get started with the show, though, I'm going to pass it off to my buddy Spurge with a quick word from our sponsor, Motul. So a big shout out to Motul for coming back as the title sponsor for season six of High Side, Low Side. And I also want to give him a personal thank you for helping me keep my vehicles clean this summer. Coming back from Get On Adventure Fest out in South Dakota, my 890 rally was covered in bugs and the Motul Moto Wash took care of every last one of them. However, when I took my truck into the car wash, it came back still caked with bugs. So what did I do? I pulled old Tammy the Tacoma out back, sprayed some Motul Moto Wash all over the front grill, let it set for a few minutes, and I power washed it, and those bugs were gone. So Motul Moto Wash is not just helping me keep my 890 looking fresh and spotless. It's also helping my Tacoma look nice and clean as well. So big shout out to Motul. Hopefully they're helping you keep your vehicles clean as well. And just thank you for coming back and, you know, assisting Zach and I as we bring season six to you, the listener. So without any further ado, let's get started. All righty, everybody. Welcome yet again, for real this time. To episode one, Spurge. <laughs> episode one six. of season six. We are wow. back. How about it? So uh, a couple quick updates uh, in the break between seasons five and six. Uh, Spurge and I, um, well, I was going to say we both went to get on Adventure Fest, but we did not. Spurge went. I did not because I got COVID. Spurge, you got COVID earlier in the summer. So it was, it was the summer of COVID. It really was for, for a lot of different uh, people on the team. I think yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody had their hand at it at least once uh, in the past uh, four or five months. But I will say that I was disappointed that you got it just before you were supposed to come out and join us in South Dakota because mm -hmm. it was easily, uh, as I think Ari Henning or Brandon Wise or Jen Dunstan or Patrick Garvin, who will be on here in a second, can attest to, uh, probably the best one we've had yet. The trails were awesome. The riding was awesome. The, the There was a lake that we got to swim in at the end of it with a slip and slide going into it. <laughs> the beer floweth like uh, wine, uh, thanks to Fast House, who <laughs> sponsored it again. We weren't allowed, so fun fact, uh, if you guys or girls were at the Get on Adventure Fest in Mojave, where Zach and I were our guest bartenders for the one mm -hmm. evening, they yep. wouldn't let us do that in South Dakota because we don't have our bartending licenses. So RevZilla is actively trying to figure out how to get us licensed in the state of South Dakota as bartenders <laughs> uh, for next year so that we can serve beer once again to uh, just Just so that hosts fans. can pass out beer. Yep. Wow. Really, yep. Revzil is really focusing on the big problems in the world. I think you'll find everybody. Hey, I appreciated the tips. We got quite a few <laughs> tips from the people in uh, Mojave last year, and I used that to pad some of my podcasting income. <laughs> Okie doke. Well, um, let's uh, let's kick off uh, the actual podcast for real. Come on, everybody. Let's seriously let's get going here. We have a section we like to call "Not the News." We realize that this podcast is recorded uh, sometimes. Uh, weeks in advance of when it goes live, we cannot really be, um, you know, we're not, we're not the Daily, we're not the Wall Street Journal here. We're not uh, going to be hard hitting with with current events. So I mean, there, are, there about... have been plenty of comments with people comparing <laughs> us to the Washington Post. So I mean, it's kind of we're kind of news like. Did I say Washington Post or Wall Street Journal? Wall Street Journal. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well. I'm just throwing out, I was throwing out another it, news organization. <laughs> in either case, those people are obviously crazy. Um, but we do want to talk about uh, at least one item per podcast that, um, that is affecting the world of motorcycles and, uh, and will hopefully provoke some thought from you, the listener or viewer. This time around, um, it's Ural Sidecars. If you're familiar with the company Ural, uh, it's, an, it's an aged Russian brand of BMW knockoff sidecars that they've been making for a very long time. And uh, after 80 years of headquarters in Russia, or manufacturing headquarters in Russia, I should say, Ural has moved to Kazakhstan on account of uh, Russia invading neighboring countries, which is a pretty interesting uh, effect 
on the motorcycle industry, I'd say. Yeah, it was interesting because when the statement was made, uh, I believe it was the CEO said, you know, as far, and this is a quote, said, as far as our association with Russia is concerned, um, you know, we don't have much to say about it. We made our views on this war very clear from day one. Our decision is now to set up a new assembly in a different country, uh, which should speak volumes to anybody who cares to think about it critically. And that was kind of, you know, they left it yeah. up to the public to right. make their decision on that. Right, right. They, they, kind of, uh, they kind of denounced the war early on. Um, which is an interesting play from Ural because Ural makes like a couple thousand sidecars a year or something like that. Not exactly a titan of manufacturing, not exactly a flagship of of Russian, you know, industrial might or anything. Uh, and it definitely seems like the kind of thing where uh, that could get you in trouble in Russia. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like a company could say, like, man, it's BS that um, you know that Russia invaded Ukraine, and then and then have. Uh, you know, have someone in high up in the in the government in Russia be like, okay, well, we're just you know going to chop the head off that company, or we're going to you know, whatever. yeah, we're all of a sudden something. the company's just gone. Like like that's yeah. happened in in yeah. Russian history in the past where things just disappear. <laughs> you know, we don't we don't see them anymore. Yeah. But what I will say is, so you mentioned manufacturing. Here's a fun fact, and and we can kind of play this with our audience a little bit. We'll give a dramatic pause. At the height of the Soviet Union, so for those of you that might be younger uh, or might just not be versed in history, the Soviet <laughs> Union was a country that was founded after uh, World War II, where um, basically Russia got a bunch of neighboring countries and they called it the Soviet Union. We'll just leave it at that. That's your basic history lesson. <laughs> That's uh, a quick, when, quick version of that story. Yeah. When the Soviet Union fell in uh, 1989, 1990, things changed for Ural. But during the era of the Soviet Union, um, they, you know, the, the real story there was that you're only allowed to use goods produced inside the country. Mm -hmm. How many motorcycles was Ural producing at the height of its production during the Soviet era? 100,000. That is correct. You must have read the article. Um, <laughs> there is an article up on Common Trend, but yeah, for those of you out there that did not know, uh, at the height of production, Ural was producing about 100,000 motorcycles a year uh, for use within the Soviet Union. Since then, uh, Zach is correct, the production has fallen to roughly around 2,000 motorcycles a year worldwide. Uh, so that is that is definitely um, it, it's not a, a huge player in the world of you know motorcycle manu manufacturing, but it is a very unique niche, and Certainly. you know. The, CD, the CEO was also quoted as saying, we believe that the world is a, a better place with Ural in it. And if you've ever ridden a Ural, uh, they are quite fun. And, you know, you can take multiple totally. people. Uh, people that sometimes are afraid to get in the back of a motorcycle aren't afraid to get into a sidecar. They feel a little bit safer with that. So there's definitely a place for Ural in the, the world of motorcycling. Do you agree with that statement, Spurgeon, that the, the world of motorcycling is a better place with, with Ural in it? I agree with that. I, I think yeah. that uh, I have had some experiences with Ural where I tried to take them in situations where they weren't necessarily uh, appropriate to go, yep. and Not I've learned my do. lesson. However, yep. for like just blasting around town or like taking a nephew for a ride or uh, a friend for a ride that might be afraid of motorcycling, like I think yeah. I think uh, a manufactured uh, OEM sidecar rig, and for those of you that uh, are not familiar with Ural, Ural is a motorcycle that makes roughly about 35 to 45 horsepower, but it has a sidecar with it. So it's a manufactured rig that you get from the OEM, has a sidecar already attached, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a fun little treat, you know? It's not something that's going to win any land speed records, but it's just, it kind of goes back to, like, the not fundamentals gonna, of motorcycling. Not going to win any speed records. But uh, they are a hoot, um, and it uh, is encouraging, I think, to, to see the company, um, you know, taking a stand and move into a stand and they you know it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky balance to to sort of i don't know to to, to keep manufacturing going and and uh, feel like you're paddling in the right direction in the situation that you're all in but um but i don't know i guess i'm i guess i'm encouraged by it um and i think it's interesting that they're they're kind of uh there's a bit of a theme of uh of of people and companies 
kind of defecting from uh, separating themselves from from Russia because of what it means either from an industrial standpoint or a, an optic standpoint or whatever it is. So well, the, the biggest uh, pro- the biggest problem with Ural, and this gets back to what the article was, you know, some of the fundamentals was they were having trouble getting supplies to, to build motorcycles. So, I mean, this right. was kind of like in order for them to continue to survive as an actual company and to stay solvent, they had to move out of Russia because they had these suppliers they had been working with for years. And the only way to get the parts that they needed was to to move the the factory to uh, to Kazakhstan. Now, there, the, the original older factory in Urbit uh, still does exist. It's about mm-hmm. 400 miles away from the new location, and they are still like there's certain parts that uh, Euro manufacturers like the crankshafts and all their painted parts. So those parts are still being manufactured in Russia, and then they mm-hmm. ship them to Kazakhstan. Now that eventually, eventually that will change, and all manufacturing supposedly will move outside of Russia. But for right now, it is a bit of a split operation, so that they can get their parts sent to them from their suppliers. Yeah. An interesting, uh, interesting story. Hopefully, you feel uh, your motorcycle knowledge is richer for it. I'd like to end the not the news section with a prediction, Spurgeon Dunbar. Um, do you think that Ural will stay away from Russia forever, or do you think that the, that they'll that Rush, that, that Ural would move back on a, uh, if if the politics change and and the you know whatever geopolitical status of, of Russia shifts? Do you think Ural would move back, or do you think they're gone for good from Russia? So I would guess. Now this is based on a brief Google search of <laughs> uh, hotel costs in. Uh, in um, Kazakhstan, it seems like a relatively affordable place to go visit. And I'm assuming (laughs) it would probably be a relatively affordable place to open a factory. Uh, And you're not dealing with those political constraints that seem to plague Russia. So my prediction... Not not as many anyway. Not as many, right. I, I would say that my prediction would be that they would stay outside of russia however okay. this is a brand that has i mean they're they're I, they are they're identified as a russian brand and they've been yeah. a russian brand for 80 years yeah. um you know so it's hard to say i'm going to go on the record though and say that i'm guessing that once they make the move to this new factory and they've got all this set up and they've got their new supply lines in order i can't see them uprooting again just to go back uh mm-hmm. just to say like hey we're going to go back for the nostalgia of it I'm, I'm guessing that this is a permanent move for them Right. Okay. What about you? What about you? I think I would agree with that. Yeah, I think just the, the forces of kind of momentum will 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 keep him there. And I don't think that ultimately people who buy Urals care that much that they are manufactured in Russia. And I think it's more like a it's a fun piece of history. It's a sort of a a, a conversational party trick that like oh it's a Russian sidecar and it, the fact that it's made in Kazakhstan will make a difference. So I think that they'll I think that they'll stay. And uh, I suppose I hope it works out. Uh, was okay. Kazakh? Was Kazakh? This is a question that did, I should know the answer to. <laughs> is Kazakhstan part of the Soviet Union? Was it part of the Soviet Union? I think so. I'm but you know, I don't up. know the answer to that question either. While anyway, you, Spurgeon, you keep going. While Spurgeon looks that up, and we uh, get you the answer that you've been dying to know, whether or not Kazakhstan was in the Soviet Union, let's bring Mr. Patrick Garvin in here and uh, get started with our. Topic of the day, how many motorcycles in the garage is too darned many? Patrick, welcome to the podcast yet again. Uh, thank you so much for having me back, guys. This is awesome. How was, uh, <laughs> how was your summer? Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, doing what I love, riding motorcycles all over the place. So uh, anytime I get to do that, it's a good summer. And what did you buy over the summer? Let our audience know. Oh, my God. <laughs> I bought yet another KTM. Uh, KTM 890 <laughs> Adventure R. Yes. Yes, you did. Did you ride that at uh, Get On Adventure Fest, Patrick? No, I bought it just... <laughs> timing. Just after? Just after. Like, oh, just after. curses. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'd like to pivot away from KTM. I know it's going to piss Spurgeon off. No, but, no, no. I'm just um, saying Patrick Patrick talk, rode with okay. me, and I nope, had an I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Sorry, we can't hear you, Spurgeon. You must be you be breaking up a little bit. Anyway, for those of you uh, listening to the podcast and not watching on the YouTubes, um, behind Patrick is a pretty intriguing machine. You got an Indian FTR with knobbies on it. Is that what I'm seeing? Yes, that is uh, an FTR with TKC80s on it. <laughs> that is a pretty bad idea. Um, yep. How how much uh, how much trouble have you gotten yourself into on that bike? 
Well, if you could see the lift, you would see the giant pool of fork oil that is <laughs> leaking out of the left leg. <laughs> I see. So just enough trouble to blow some fork seals then. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Who would who'd have thunk that a 515-pound bike with knobbies on it would be a problem for fork seals? Weird, right? I mean, if it, it, it jumps great and it lands terribly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. All right. Well, um, the FTR on the lift and your, your spanky new... Uh, KTM 890R uh, um, is a great segue to the topic of conversation today, which is essentially uh, how many bikes in the garage is too many. This stems from mm. an email that we received from a fella who said, I think it was a fella, it actually could have been a gal, come to think of it, um, who said, I met a girl years ago whose dad owns 20 plus motorcycles. I have so many questions about her dad's experience in owning such a big number. What are the pros and cons? Uh, how expensive is it? Uh, do you have any tips for for owning that many motorcycles? So we're gonna we're gonna use this little nugget to dive into discussion. Um, the the first thing I think we wanted to talk about, correct me if I'm wrong, Spurge, is how many motorcycles? What's the maximum number of motorcycles we have each owned? Right. I think so. Yeah. I think a great way to segue is getting a little bit more uh, personal with yes. our audience. And Patrick, I, I think as always, guest honors makes yes. a lot of sense in this particular situation. Uh, at one point in time, like what is the most amount of motorcycles you ever have ever owned at its height uh, and its glory of, of how many you've had in the garage? <laughs> you, pers uh, you, you personally, not like J and P bikes, but like you personally. Right. It's very close to right now. As oh. of like uh, a couple months ago, probably. And I currently <laughs> at my second most. So okay. I, okay. What was what was peak? Give us a number. Eleven. 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 Yes. That's no joke. Can you name them all? I can name the ten I have now. Yeah. I guess <laughs> I can name eleven. Yeah. Uh, let's, so let's hear I, it. So I, I. I guess I can cheat a little bit. The one is my like my son. So let's, let's start with like smallest. We have um, YZ125. I have a Got CRF it. 250X. Uh, we have a, I have a KTM 300 EXC. These are great choices. I have a Kawasaki KLX 450R. Spurgeon is very familiar with. We spent a lot of time together. On that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the new 890 Adventure R. Uh -huh. uh, I have an 89 FXR. I That's have, a Harley Davidson for those of you that don't yep. know. I have a 72 uh, Harley Davidson Sportster. I have a 76 GT 250. Uh, what, uh, what is that? What? A uh, GT250? Yeah, 76 Suzuki GT250. Suzuki, the, okay. So yep. is that, that's a little air-cooled two-stroke? Two, yeah, twin so it's, it's two a twin. Stroke? Yep, exactly. Oh, I gotcha, forgot one right, on the small side. I have a Kawasaki Z125. Right, okay. So and we're have, at nine now? Uh-huh, and a Buell okay. Blast. And I have a Buell Blast. That's also a small one I forgot. And so a there's, Buell Blast. <laughs> yes. Okay, and then what was the bike you got rid of recently, the 11th? Uh, yeah, my 690 Supermoto, which I was very hesitant gotcha. to, to get rid of. What? Okay. Yeah. Well, I can see why you kept the Buell Blast and you got rid of the 690 Supermoto. As it turns out, trade-in value is not as good on a Buell Blast <laughs> as it is on a 690 Supermoto. <laughs> okay, that's very, very fair. It's, uh, the when Buell Blast, for those of you that don't know, is the bike that um, I think Buell itself, the company, had had a like a some sort of promo campaign where they they smashed it into a cube. Of metal. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? It's a very weird little motorcycle. It is a weird little motorcycle. It's not that it's bad, but it is often maligned. Let's say that. The frame um, so is the wacky. Fact... Yeah, it's a good beginner bike. Right, right. Yeah, but so I, guess, why... I guess when you're trying to when you're trying to pay the bills on a new 890 uh, Adventure R, the trade in value <laughs> on a 690 is probably a little uh, more substantial. See. Yeah. Yes. So this the 690 Supermoto trade in and the 890R purchase were related. Yes, that makes directly sense. Okay, related. Okay. And now also, I see why it, you, you know it's going to. Without to get too far in the conversation, it other, brings up something else as far as like what I was doing with the 690, and I love that bike, but I kept putting it more and more and more in the dirt. Right. And so it got to the point where I was either going to have to make that more dirt specific, or just get rid of it for something that was more dirt specific. Right. And it came down to like, well, I'm going to. Yeah, I can't ride them both at the same time, and the things I'm going to do with the 890 the 690 is going to sit anyway. So, yeah, okay. All right, well that's a, that's a fantastic little run through. Great choices. Love a love a Honda CRF 250X, love a, a 350 EXC KTM. This is these are great choices for dirt bikes. Um, yeah, I like it. I got I got, I got more questions, but let's yeah. let's stay focused for now. Spurge, what about you? Most number of bikes you've ever owned? 
Uh, so the most I've ever owned at one time was five. So roughly mm -hmm. a little less than half of what Patrick's owned. Um, and that has happened twice in my motorcycling career. Uh, the first one was Honda VFR 800, Triumph Tiger 800. Uh, Only 800s. Triumph Bonneville uh, 865, yep. T100. Uh, the 1976 Honda CB550 and a Kawasaki uh, 440 LTZ 1981. So, Whoa. yeah, the only other time that I've had five, five was actually when I when I bought the 1090. When I bought the 1090, uh, there was some crossover between owning the 1090 and the and the Tiger at the same time. Um, and then to Patrick's point, um, you know, I. I, I not necessarily counting other people's bikes that might be living in the garage at you know any respected time. So your your peak motorcycle ownership number was five street bikes, right? Yes. No dirt bikes in that in that mix. Well, I'm trying to think because when I owned 1090 10, 350, oh, you, you had you had the Tiger 800. So yeah. It's VFR 800, Tiger 800. Yep. Bonnie T100. Yep. And then the uh, 76 CB and the, and and the, the CB 550 Cowie. and then the LTZ. So there, yeah, so there were no dirt bikes at that point no, in time. No, no pure dirt bike. Interesting, interesting. Dirt bike, yeah. dirt bike, pure dirt bike came later. Right. Um, and then when I had the pure dirt bike, by that point, I was down to four. So there was no, when it, by the time the dirt bike came into the equation, I was down to four. Right. Right, right. Yep. And now okay. there's now there's now there's two, but we'll get into that a little bit later on. So, right. Zach, what about yourself? So, Zach, I know that that you just recently sold a motorcycle, but your uh, your peak, what was your peak? I and we're did, and we're I counting did. we're counting scooters. So, okay. that's good because otherwise my number would be very low. Um, my my peak ownership of motorcycles, I think, was three, and I did sell my scooter recently. So I'm down to two, uh, and one of those bikes is a mini bike. I don't even know if that really counts. Um, it counts. It's a uh, motor. It's two wheels. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a Honda CRF50 uh, little supermoto thingy that I, uh, that I have around as sort of a pit bike thing. Uh, and I do love it. It's great. Uh, and then my KTM 950 supermoto. Um, and I just sold that Aprilia scooter, uh, which I would like to replace. I'm not sure if this, is, uh, this, this conversation actually comes at an appropriate time because I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to dive in later maybe and try and dissect Zach's brain. Like, do I want more bikes because I feel like that makes me a true motorcyclist or do I actually just want the, you know, the, the, the capability and the, and the convenience of having a scooter around? Or, well, I was, do I just like, need more machines? I don't know. I was at the, the Brooklyn Revzilla store opening recently, and I talked to a gentleman who was very enthusiastic to talk to you about scooters. And I almost FaceTimed you. I was there talking to this guy. <laughs> and I almost, I almost pulled you up on FaceTime just to impress him that I could do it. Um, uh, but he wanted to know about, you know, he wanted to know specifically more about your interest in scooters and like what scooters are good, what scooters are bad. He wants more scooters on Daily Rider. He, oh, he had a, he had a whole scooter thing. So I, I would actually like <laughs> to, to dissect your brain later and say, if you were going to replace the Aprilia, which I believe was like a little two stroke scooter, is that correct? Yep. Like what, what scooter would you see yourself replacing that one with? Uh, probably something not a two stroke. <laughs> I mean, I like two stroke. I mean, I, I had a pretty uh, SR50, which was a little fuel injected two stroke, and it's very cool. Um, Aries got a little two stroke Zuma 50, which is fun. I mean, I like I like the way two strokes smell, I like the way they sound. I I get a I get a real kick out of two strokes, and I like them. But I think realistically, I probably a little four stroke something, whether it's a like a Vespa 150 or a, a, I'm kind of hot to trot for that eight that Honda ADV 150. Um, cause we had a test bike around a couple years ago and, and bopped around on it. And like, you know, it's not really like, it just like looks a little bit more rough and tumble than a usual scooter, but it's ultimately the, the same kind of basic capability. It's like a little 150 CC, uh, four stroke single and it's got under seat storage and uh, it's pretty comfortable. And, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a good little, good little bop around. Spencer's got, um, uh, a Zuma 125 Yamaha Zuma 125, which is, uh, similarly, you know, I don't know. They're, they're kind of the, the older ones are kind of cool looking. They got like the little dual round headlights. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, something like that is probably what the direction I'll go. 
Nice. And then Patrick, you were saying that you were counting your son's bike because I'm assuming like, do you do a lot of the the maintenance for him on that? Like, you keep it keep it up and running for him, or does he take some he, of the responsibility on? He does it. His 125. He bought. Um, it's a 04, and he bought it for 700 bucks. It was pretty clapped out. Wow. And then we did. Uh, I mean, he honestly did probably 70 percent of the work, and then we uh, did like a ground up on that. And honestly, the 250 is also one of his projects. He bought for 300 bucks with a title. <sighs> And um, so no way the 250x. Yeah, so the guy had uh, put a new top end in it, and it wouldn't turn over. And turns <laughs> out we, for for the, yeah for those of you listening, Patrick's using yeah. air quotes. <laughs> yeah, so it uh, yeah it has title and everything, and turned he put the cam in 180 out, you know. Oh yeah. So he, when he went to push the so it just it would just you know seize up. So we we bought it, pulled the top end off, put a new Weisco piston in it. And uh, we're almost, it's basic, we're, we're waiting on uh, a muffler right now and some plastics, and then that'll be up and ready to go. Nice, that's a score. That's yeah. cool. So those two are right on, technically right his. But yeah, he does, I would say he does probably 70% of the work. He would rather nice, do it nice. than have me do it. Is, is, <laughs> is, that, is that a flip project for him, or does he plan on keeping that one? I think I've talked him into keeping it because, you know, Spurge, you're familiar with out here. It's very, very advantageous to have a dirt bike with a plate. Mm -hmm. You know, the 125, we do ride in the trails and stuff out here. But sometimes to get to that, we have to throw it on a little trailer to get it there in the back of his truck. Whereas if you have something with a plate, you just zip out into the street and go up the road. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I... Yeah, the the uh, uh, he's so you said it's a YZ 125. Yeah. So it's a it's a 125 two stroke motocrosser. I you know that bike sir, uh, has a certain charm. I haven't ridden that bike specifically, but I know that 125 uh, motocrosser two strokes have a certain charm. But it's really hard to imagine that the 250X isn't just a better. Oh yeah, 100. And <laughs> a like, better uh, bike to you race know, through trails and stuff. The 125 is like his first like real motor. I mean, he had a 65 and an right. 85, and we kept the 65, sold the 85. Um, 65 in parts, but I mean, like, so it's his first like big motorcycle that he did the project see, yeah, on. Yeah. So I don't think he'll ever get yeah, rid of it. Fair. But yeah. you're right, man. Like I've ridden the thing in trails. I mean, basically, <clears throat> you have to like beat the living daylights out of it all the time. Like you just have yeah. to ride it at a 10 constantly. Just, like, like fan the clutch oh, the whole time. Yes. Just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just abuse it uh, to ride it. Yeah. So uh, back to this motorcycle ownership thing. Um, we, we've thrown in some caveats, each mm -hmm. one of us, I think. Um, I'm curious. Uh, some of some like one of my bikes and some of uh, your bikes currently, Patrick, mm. do not require registration, or you would they wouldn't be registered. Um, but of the bikes that can be registered for the street and used on the street and plated and insured and all that stuff, are, and this question goes for you as well, Spurge. Eventually, are they all registered? And like, are you are you are you paying bills on all those bikes? Like your, the FXR, the old two-stroke Yamaha. Yeah, so like I would say, let's see, just off the top of my head, almost, yeah, the Suzuki isn't, the 250 isn't. Oh, sorry, there's a Suzuki, not a Yamaha, my bad. Yeah, it's, it's not registered, but almost everything else is. Luckily, our registration fees here in South Dakota are, are pretty pretty reasonable. But okay. yeah, I mean, like the, the all the dirt bikes except for the 125 have plates. Um, the Z125 has a plate. The FXR has a plate. The oh the 72 Sportster isn't currently registered. So like that's the other thing we're gonna do. There are certain okay. like there's like three or four of these that are definitely projects, but everything <laughs> everything yeah, else enough. has got has got a, a, a plate registration. Right, right. So that's definitely something to think about. Yep, for sure. So what about you, Spurge? Are yeah, I was just say that. So it, it's funny. So just as a quick uh, housekeeping note uh, for for you, Zach, I think what we what we do here is we we're gonna save topic two uh, for for later, and, and I'll tell you about why why that is in a second because I feel like we're getting into <laughs> pros and cons right now. So going back to the original question here, mm. you know, uh, for the email that came in was you know having so many motorcycles, what are some of the pros and cons? And when you're talking about registration, having a lot of motorcycles, I would say is a con when it comes to registration. You have to keep up with registration. Um, up until recently in the state of Pennsylvania, where I'm from, you had to register your bikes every year. Uh, they've recently changed that where you can now pay for two-year registration, uh, really? which is, which is hmm. nice if you know that you're going to keep the bike. Like So my Bonneville, I'm always paying for two-year registration on. Um, the and there's no discount for doing it. It's just that you only have to do it every two years. Yeah, my, yeah. so like your bookkeeping is a little bit easier, basically. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. with the 350... And, you know, up until recently, my 1090, those I was paying for one-year registrations on because I wasn't sure. And I ended up selling the 1090. I didn't want to pay for too much. Um, but, 
yeah, so I have I've sold most of my project bikes during the pandemic. I sold I sold two bikes during the pandemic, and there's a third one that's kind of in limbo. Uh, but the project bikes that I had at the time, I would not register them uh, because they were they were being worked on, they weren't being ridden, and I did not feel like spending the, the money every year to go through you know paying the state for something that wasn't being used. So uh, I would say that if my bike is being ridden, and right now I've got one, two, three, four, four active riding motorcycles. Uh, those are all currently registered every year. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what about yourself? I'm, I'm assuming your, your pit bike, you don't have to, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's, not, that's not, I just have a title for that. And it's like, yeah, that you can't even register it. I don't think there's no, like, I think I could insure it if I wanted to, but I think I paid 400 bucks for it. So like, why would I do that? Um, yeah. And my, my, my KTM is, is uh, registered and insured, all that jazz. Um, well, that's a so question. Yeah, well, that's a question. So what about, what about insurance <clears throat> for you? So uh, you, and, you and Patrick are probably in different situations. Are, you and Patrick are probably different situations than myself. Um, when it comes to insuring all of your bikes, it doesn't sound like you insure the small one. The little one? No, I don't. No, hmm. the, my, my little like mini bike. I don't insure it because because I can't imagine a situation where insurance would be helpful, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Does that make sense? Do I sound like an asshole saying that? I, I don't, I, yeah, the, I don't, it would be. Well, because you're, you're, be, you're, not, you're not riding on the street, so you don't know, no. you don't need to worry about like covering somebody else. You're only riding at a racetrack, so you really don't need to worry about covering someone else. And if you wreck it, you're not going to file an insurance claim to fix anything you would just fix yep. it yourself so yeah and that, if that so, makes sense and if someone steals it i'm just gonna be like that sucks <laughs> um and yeah i mean i suppose i could worry about inflicting some damage to a person or some person's property when i had it at a racetrack or something and then i wouldn't have insurance on that vehicle but like that is for anyone who's been to a, <laughs> a racing club or like any kind of situation like that i i that would be a That'd be a nasty bit of luck for, to have that happen. I don't think that would be a. I knocked on, I knocked on wood so, for you. So we're thank good. you very much. Yeah, yeah, I should do that. Um, yeah. So were you going to pass the same question to yourself to, to Patrick? I was, yeah, I wanted I wanted Patrick to, to. How many of your bikes? I mean, you said you had uh, eleven, but you're currently at ten. How mm-hmm. many of those bikes do you pay insurance on? How many How many insurance and legal questions can we ask you before you're like, look, guys, I don't really want to talk about. <laughs> I moved to South Dakota to avoid these kind of questions. Um, I would say probably, I think maybe half of them are insured. So like the, none of the dirt bikes have insurance on them. Yeah. Yep. So that, that cuts out, you know, quite a bit of those. And then the Suzuki and the Ironhead Sportster and the Buell currently doesn't have any on it, but everything else is insured. Your, your KX450R, are you counting that as a dirt bike that doesn't have insurance on it? I count that are as you- a dirt bike that doesn't have insurance. Cause like Zach said, like if something, it would suck <laughs> if somebody stole it, but um, also, if anything ever happened to, I would just fix it if it broke or you know anything catastrophic. Yeah. I broke a wheel last year and just bought a new wheel. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it doesn't yeah. have insurance on it. But don't yeah, you have yeah. to have? But don't you have to have insurance on it to drive it on the street to have a license plate? I don't believe so. Well, great, I'm gonna get sued in South Dakota. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, honestly, this is a good question for my wife because she handles all of this stuff for me because I ah. am a giant baby. Um, <laughs> next on the podcast, next on the podcast, <laughs> next on the podcast, we're joined by Emma Garvin to talk about Patrick's financial responsibilities yes. to his motorcycles. Yes. So, <laughs> so it's fair, I think, to talk about that as a mm-hmm. con, right? Like, the, as far as bookkeeping, sure. keeping track of all of the registration, all the insurance for the street bikes that are insured, um, and and also the financial, I want to say strain, but the financial responsibility yeah. of paying for all that stuff. That's not nothing. I mean, you've nope. got you, you've got ten bikes. And you said, what, six of them are registered I think or six, six or seven of them? Six or seven are registered. At least five of them are insured. So, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a not a you know, trivial sum of money. You definitely have to take yeah, that yeah, consideration yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that, yeah, so that, that's certainly something to think about. So I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to trip, pivot kind of a little bit to pros mm-hmm. a little bit. And I think the two of you will, can speak uh, more um, but from more experience on, on the pros of having multiple bikes, but there's, there's some joy there too, right? Like oh, talking well, about some of the things that you get out of having multiple bikes, but whether it's multiple capabilities or just sort of the, the joy of enjoying different machines, like what do you, what do you feel like you get out of that? 
I have a longer list of cons before we. I mean, we can we can pivot to pros as long okay, as we come no, back no, to cons. No, 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 you're right. Fair enough. Fine. No, keep, I, keep talking. No, I, I guess I guess my my whole point with this, right? Because the real question was around pros and cons, and I think that people oftentimes glorify owning a lot of motorcycles. Mm-hmm. And and when we were in pre-production, one of the questions that I jokingly threw out at Zach was, "Well, do I have the money that I make now?" Or in this imaginary scenario, <laughs> do I get unlimited amounts of money that I can just pay somebody to maintain, you know, my right, right. fleet? Because not only is but, it the extra cost of all that stuff, but then there's there's maintenance and like right. maintaining all of these motorcycles is time consuming when you are doing it yourself. And I know Patrick, I'm looking at you as someone that, you know, you're wrenching in your in your work time and then you're also wrenching in your free personal time to update your own personal fleet. So like maintenance is something that like keeping track of all the different schedules for all these different bikes and then doing the work is a bit of a con. Yeah, it's a bit of a con. I, I think even a you know tagging onto that is like um, aftermarket stuff because I'm not, typically not somebody that leaves a motorcycle alone. So I have like plans for all these or like some projects like the FXR is a project. Well, you can't, you know, you have to prioritize what part you're going to buy for what bike when you're going to buy it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I yep. need a muffler for the Honda and I need the muffler tab broke in my Kawasaki. So I need a muffler for that. Well, which one do you get? You know, I mean, so there's not just maintenance. Like when you're buying parts, there's more bikes to buy parts for. And then I think one of the biggest ones is like, where do you put them? Like, where do you, st- yeah. where do you store them? I was going to say them? storage. So, like, yeah. I have um, four four in my garage at home. And then I have a storage unit that has the other ones with the exception of my FXR, which actually sits behind my desk here at work. <laughs> so, you, if, <laughs> you know, you got so to have like, to... You need, an, you, you, need, you need an employer that will let you park your motorcycles right, well, you in the office. Yeah. You can park a motorcycle behind your desk. Um, <laughs> but, like, yeah, I mean, if I didn't have my little storage unit down the street, like I wouldn't have any place to put that. Like my, my garage would right. just be like stepping over motorcycles all the time. I feel like four is a lot in there. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, it's, enough, it, it's interesting because I have, so I live in a townhouse in Philly and when I bought the house, the first thing I did was I knocked down the wall uh, that joins the garage and the and the basement. So I, it's like, if you look at the front of the house, it looks like it's just a little two-story house. But if you go around the back, it's three stories because the garage goes underneath the house. So I knocked out the wall and I put in doors and that way I could actually get my motorcycles into the basement. So now I can't just, you know, I can store them in the basement. I can, I have a little workshop set up in there and then I store them in the garage. But, you know, I remember when I moved to Philadelphia, when I moved to Nashville, when I lived in LA, it was like every place that you went to look at to rent, you know, as a motorcyclist, you know, looking at renting a house that had a garage was yep. always something that was top on the list. And typically that adds an exponential amount of money to what you're paying in rent or on your mortgage if you're if you're a homeowner, because you have to have a garage or you at least want to have a garage. You know, even if you can't have one, it's always an ambition there. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. That, that's, that's a big piece of the lifestyle of having a bike or multiple bikes around. Uh, it's <laughs> like every time you look for a place to live, my, my wife has gotten used to anytime, anytime we move, you know, she's like, okay, well, I understand that like it does, if I like, if I like a place a lot, it, uh, if it doesn't have a garage, it's probably off the table because yeah, exactly. I have a place to put stuff, which is, um, uh, uh, I appreciate that she tolerates that. Uh, any other, any other cons on your, on your list there, Spurge? I think we've, we've covered, um, so we've covered, uh, sort of maintenance, uh, uh, you know, opportunity cost there and then, you know, registration costs and insurance costs and storage, which is an issue. Uh, anything else come to mind? The, the main one that comes to mind, well, Patrick, what do you have? I said, this is, you know, again, a little bit weird, but for me, it like pulls my attention away from projects, like, because I tend to buy projects, you know what I mean? And like, like my Kawasaki was a project, the Honda was a project. So I, so a lot, I think about this a lot is like, if I had less, would I concentrate on this one thing and would it be better built than if I'm, I'm building three or four things at one time, mm-hmm, if I just mm-hmm. like focused all my attention and resources on this mm-hmm. one thing? How much better would it be than me like spreading, you know, time and money to to other projects? So I I don't know if that's a con, but it's something I actually think about quite a bit when it comes to motorcycles. Uh, I, think I think it's, it's I, I think it's a con. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it depends on the type of person that you are, but certainly I think it's fair to say, the more bikes you have around, 
the less focused you're going to be on one or two of them, mm -hmm. right? For sure. <laughs> and so that's that's either what you want or it's a con. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, but I struggle. So I struggle. I struggle that with, with with maintenance a lot, right? Like if I'm if I'm maintaining if I'm maintaining the 350, then chances are I'm not maintaining the 890. And like I just got back from this big ride with the 890, so it's like the 890 needs all this attention, but like the 350. But it was like, I remember wrapping up a bunch of rides with the 350 and putting it away and saying, I'll come back to that and I'll change the oil and do all the maintenance and stuff when I get back. And then I spent my time prepping the 890 for Get On Adventure Fest and some other stuff. And then I got back from Get On Adventure Fest and now the 890 needs all this attention. But now I've got two bikes that need this attention. So it's like, well, which bike do I need to use first next? So it, it does become a bit cumbersome to keep it straight. The only other thing that I was going to throw in there as an additional consideration on the con side would be if you live in a state that requires state inspections. Now mm. I live in Pennsylvania and I'm not going to get into it publicly with the two of you and the rest <laughs> of our listening audience as to whether or not I actually regularly pay for state inspections on my motorcycles. Uh -huh. uh, but you're supposed to. Um, and, and if you have four or five motorcycles and you're spending 70 bucks a year on state inspection and you're spending another 70 odd bucks a year on registration and you're spending how many hundreds of dollars on insurance and then you're doing that for multiple motorcycles it does it does add up pretty quickly so i think you know state inspections is probably another one to keep in mind there um mm -hmm. yeah, just keep, keep, keep keeping track of you know if not if not the cost yep right these are uh these are first world problems i suppose like oh, i gotta have like an extra garage to keep all my bikes oh, in man. and like yeah. i gotta have extra money to register my bikes and like which bike do i work on first um, but one thing I do want to ask about, especially you, Patrick, you have any, well, aside from having your wife do <laughs> some of the organizing there, but like, do you have any tips, uh, or kind of like, like, do you have any tricks to, I don't know, do you try to like sync up the registrations so that they're all due at the same time? Or like, I don't know, is there, is there any, like, are there any kind of like, do you use a spreadsheet or a whiteboard or like, what do you do? Yeah. So I actually use Google docs for, all, for, uh, okay. I, I have one for each bike. And yep. it's not just like things that need to be done. It's like things I want to do. And so a lot of times I'll put the parts, <laughs> like the actual links to the parts in there. Because again, like you, it's a budgetary concern. You know what I mean? So I got to prioritize what I want to do to which bike when I want to do it. And it's yep. just all, honestly a lot easier, especially if it's a bigger project. Um, like the FXR was a frame off and I'm, you know, the engine's back in it and transmission and drive line. It's a roller. But to get there, you know, I had like a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that you know, needed to be kept track of. So yeah, I, I keep um, a Google Doc on each bike. That's very helpful. Smart. Mm -hmm. Is it now? Is it a Doc or is it a Google Sheet? It's Sheet. Ah, yeah, okay. It's Sheet. Right. Yeah. Like, like to be nice yeah. and specific here on high side, low side. <laughs> for those of what you, about, for those of you listening, uh, Google Doc is like a, a Microsoft Word, and then a Google Sheet is like Excel. So yeah. that's what we're talking. He Patrick Garvin keeps an Excel sheet. Smart, very mm -hmm. smart. I have I got a buddy that does that with uh, he's got he's got a sheet with like multiple tabs for all his mm -hmm. vehicles and keeps track of all of it. it it's smart. I, I do it electronically, but it's a much more kind of like podunk way. What about you, Spurge? You do you do you keep track of uh, uh, like maintenance stuff electronically, or is it all just up in Spurge's not? Most of it's up in Spurge's not. I did have a <laughs> I, I bought a whiteboard for the garage, and and that's how oh, okay. I was I was tracking stuff for a while where I would just you know line it off. Um, unfortunately, I haven't kept up with that. Um, and you know, I, part also of the reason to race is so easily. Well, exactly. Well, part of the reason I was asking Patrick earlier about his son is that, uh, for, uh, my now fiance, we got her a little two thirty L, which we talked about, but I am responsible for maintaining that bike. Sure. So when she leaves the key on and doesn't turn it off and the battery's dead now and <laughs> needs a new battery. Like, so I think, you know, I'm trying to keep uh, track of the, the main three bikes right now. Uh, in the garage or the 890 to 350 and then her 230. But then I'm also trying to keep track of the Bonneville's maintenance, which my dad is currently using. So, uh, and, and he hasn't given that back for two years. So I'm trying to like maintain bikes <laughs> in different areas. Um, Cause even though he's been using it, I've been the one maintaining it. And we'll talk about that in a separate podcast. Oh, Spurgeon senior, um, geez. But, uh, but yeah, so I would say he's very good at washing it and keeping it clean and, and cleaning the chain. So we'll give him we'll give him credit for that. Uh, okay. But yeah, so I I, I do I would say the whiteboard and the garage thing. I'm not as sophisticated as Patrick is with uh, with a spreadsheet. And Zach, I'm imagining that you have multiple spreadsheets and documents and you know safety deposit boxes at the bank with you know <laughs> keys and oil filters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I don't I don't log a lot of miles on my street bike to be honest because I. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, I have a job where I ride motorcycles a lot, so I have to um, focus on that mostly. Um, and I keep track of it. I have a uh, like a notepad, an Apple, whatever, like a like a, an Apple notepad uh, that I keep track of all the so like when the last oil change was, when the tires were installed, when uh, fluids were flushed, when like just sort of like a basic list of stuff. It's not as sophisticated as a, as a Google Sheet, but I'm not as uh, sophisticated a uh, a mechanic or maybe even a person as Dr. Garvin. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, it's 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 very very basic on my end. My garage is uh, small, as we know. So can we can we uh, can we talk about pros now? I think what we should do is take a break for the Motul ad, uh, keep the people in suspense, and then <laughs> we'll come back with all the pros of owning multiple motorcycles. Okie doke. It's finally it's Spurge. Uncle Spurge said it's finally time that we can talk about. Uh, pros of having multiple bikes, which of course I will not contribute to very much because I don't have very many motorcycles. But I especially want to know, um, Patrick, what do you like? What's you know, if someone says, uh, you know, you meet someone uh, out and about, and they don't have motorcycles, they don't ride motorcycles, and they say like, "Wow, you have you own ten motorcycles? That must be awesome." What do you, what do you like? What would you say? Yeah, it's pretty cool. For these reasons, I get like I, you, I would tell them they definitely need to buy a motorcycle first. <laughs> and then, you want to buy one of my motorcycles? Like, yeah, <laughs> gotta get your own, but you can definitely should buy. I I think a huge pro is having kind of like the right tool for the job. And for so long, like you know, I only had one mm-hmm. motorcycle for a long time. Even back in my drag racing days, I used to ride my bike to the track and like you know pull the front strap down on it, like lower put the lowering links in the back and ride it, like race it, and then ride it home in my leathers. So nice. I mean, it having like the tools, you know, for the job is, is very nice. You know what I mean? If you, if I want to go ride a dirt bike, I'll go ride a dirt bike. You know, I don't, if, if I had just the 890, that's great. You know what I mean? Like I can ride that in the dirt, but it's also not a 450. So right. having like a specific bike for a specific job is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that is, that's pretty cool. So you're, someone's like, Hey, we're going to go, we're riding the twisties. What bike, what bike are you taking? Like just pavement, uh, sort of like joyride, curvy roads, go get a sandwich, come home, that kind of thing. What bike are you taking? Well, right now I'm taking the 890 because I just like riding it all the time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the problem with the Swiss Army knife of motorcycles. Is that- uh, it's really good, and it's surprisingly good on the pavement. Um, actually, uh, I texted a buddy of mine, David from Biltwell, because he's you know, pretty, you know, adventure bike guy. And I'm like, how far can you push a TKC 80? Cause it seems like you can push them for pretty far on, you mean the on pa- pavement on pavement. And yeah, you can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The grip is su- very surprising. It's very a surprising. Weird to get used to, but, but yeah. They- yeah. So like right now I would take the 890 just cause it's the new thing. It actually works really well. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. Okay. So when we were at get on adventure fest in Sturgis last year, um, we were coming down, there's a, there's a really great road that Patrick took us down called Van Ocker Canyon. And it's like this like snake, like high speed twisty section. And Jeff Canary, who was out there with us, who's a fellow RevZillian, was on uh, a Tenere 700. And at the time I was on an FA 50 GS and we both had TKC 80s and we were cooking pretty good. And like he kept kind of pushing a little bit further and I was right on him pushing a little bit further <laughs> and we got down to the bottom and we stopped and we high-fived each other he's like man I was trying to lose you and I thought your tires were going to give out and I thought my tires were going to give out but like these TKC 80s just hold and I think that's the beauty of that tire um, Patrick knows that this year I was out there on a uh, a different front tire that wasn't ne- necessarily as confidence inspiring uh, <laughs> in some of the road stuff despite how great it was off-road but the TKC 80 is the true 50 50 tire if you're looking to be able to push your bike on the street and feel comfortable about it yeah there's like they don't last very long and they're expensive but aside from that they don't have a lot of downsides i don't think oh, <laughs> they pretty really darn well. well on the pavement so yeah. so just for argument's sake three months ago two months ago if i'd asked you a question you're going on a street ride you don't have an 890 what, what would you take the 690 supermoto the 690 down. okay yeah right. Yeah, the, that thing's a rocket ship, GTM. especially around here. Yeah, no, that thing is just an absolute <laughs> rocket ship here, uh, especially with all the canyon roads. Like it's, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have taken anything else. Okay. And looking into the future, I'd probably take my FXR. Once it gets finished, I would probably okay, take yep, that. Yep. yep. Cool, cool. So, um, and maybe this is the same answer, but another scenario for you: you're not going to ride, you're not going on a ride so much, but you're going to like a, like a, like a meetup or like. I don't know, someone, someone 
famous or something is in town and it's like oh we're going we're going to hang out with them and like you know bring your coolest bike like like ride down and meet us up here we're gonna there's gonna be a cookout or we're gonna have dinner we're gonna have some beers and like you know bring your coolest which bike would you take right now the coolest bike to me is 890 everybody's ah. thinking so lame what? <laughs> that is lame so, you know, so that's the that's the freaking- I would- when I finished the FXR, whoever, I would take whoever, it. Whoever's playing the, the high side, low side drinking game during this <laughs> episode hammered. is already yeah. hammered. Freaking hammered, yeah. <laughs> um, you, I, wouldn't take your, you wouldn't take your 70s Suzuki two-stroke? Yeah, that's that's, not- that's cool. I would probably, like, I, I'm not that far from finishing the FXR, and that's what I'd probably take. This is going to be a really okay. cool bike. It's going to be very different. I had yep. somebody ask me the other day um, if uh, about a bike show. I had a bike I wanted to put in it, and I was like, no. You don't want to see my dirt bikes or my or my 890s, so I don't. But that would eventually be the one would would be the FXR if it was something cool because it's a really um, it's got a it's got an engine. They only made like nine of them from SNS. It's a big cubic inch engine that they they only made a handful of, and mm-hmm. it it has a bunch of like wacky suspension things that like are, are one off and a weird set of wheels and handlebars, and so like that would be the one that I would like show off. Right. I do okay. think I do think okay. Patrick makes a good point in the fact that um, oftentimes, regardless of how many motorcycles you own, the one that you're most excited about is the most recent one that you've added to the collection. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you, you probably wouldn't have added it to your collection if you weren't excited about it. You know? Right. Right. No, exactly. that's a good point. So, what? Uh, any other pros come to mind for you, Spurge? Like owning multiple bikes? Like, uh, I guess aside from just sort of having the right tool for the job, like yeah, what, I think uh, I think right for, I think right tool for the job was top one on my list. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and especially your like, bikes are pretty diverse. To be clear, right right now, for example, you have a a pure kind of dual sport dirt bike, mm-hmm. like a, a good dirt bike, and then you've got the Triumph that your dad stole, and then yep. you've got an ADV bike. So you got kind of you get your bases. Yeah, covered, yeah, yeah. Right? I think you know where I, where, where my mind goes. Uh, you know, and I don't want to. I don't want to foreshadow too much, but like, so, you know, sometimes the debate that I have is like, do I need an 890 Rally, which is a very capable off-road machine, and a 350 dirt bike, which is an even more capable off-road machine, or like, <laughs> can I can I right. find one that blends a little bit better? But uh, again, maybe we'll save some of that for later. What I would say is that one of the things that that struck me when I was thinking about this topic as a pro is having the ability to have a motorcycle for your buddies to use when they when they come to town oh, right well, that is just plain selfless Spurgeon Dunbar I'm I'm nothing if not caring about you when you come you to visit in Philadelphia right. yeah. yeah and you know it's been it's been years now and you've yet to come visit and I cry every time uh, that my hopes are dashed but I will say that this <laughs> this topic came up recently um, after uh, I, I met a I met a, a gentleman named Brian at get on adventure fest in Mojave and he had reached out to me on Instagram. We were trading messages back and forth. And he was a Tenere 700 owner. And he said, you know, I'm thinking about buying uh, a 1090. I know that you've ridden one. You've owned one. What do you think? And then he came back and was like, well, I'm actually thinking about keeping both bikes so that my friends have a bike to ride and we can go on adventure rides together. And I was like, Brian, that's a great, that's a great ambition. I've thought about doing that too. Like when I had, when I first bought the 109 my 1090 I kept my Tiger 800 I was like this is great my friends can use the Tiger 800 we can go out we can do adventure rides together and then I thought to myself when you ride adventure bikes the way that we do off road you beat the hell out of them and they Stuff require breaks. a lot of maintenance mm-hmm. and then you're constantly cleaning repairing <laughs> chaining cleaning mm-hmm. all of it uh, air filtering and I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have Zach Quartz or Patrick Garvin come to visit me and they get to just Nobody come does. and ride my bike and then I have to do all the work afterwards. <laughs> so I said the same thing to Brian. I was like, Brian, like you can do this, but just keep in mind, you're you're going to be doing a lot of double maintenance for, for only riding one bike. And he was like, that's a really good point. So mm-hmm. there are mm. there, there's pros and cons with that specific scenario <laughs> in general. Um, there's but cons I, with your pro. I do think it's I do think it's a, a positive in, in the fact that you know if if one of the two of you were to come to visit I do have an extra motorcycle for either one of you to use um, right you know so yeah. I, I think that's a positive certainly yeah yeah, yeah you, you then you're you're evangelizing motorcycles which I suppose is a good thing I would like to say I would like to add to the pros list um, that I think multiple machines in your garage in my experience in my opinion also adds to your sort of uh, it broadens your horizon Mm -hmm. and your skills as a motorcyclist you know like one of the things i get a kick out of is riding a different 
bike, right? Like even whether it's a scooter or a, a little dirt bike or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, I get a kick out of hearing a different engine and, and having a different throttle feel and having different brakes. Like I think that stuff is fun, but it also certainly tunes different muscles, um, uh, literally and, and figuratively in your brain for how to operate different pieces of equipment. And the more different bikes you ride, the sort of better you get at it. And I think that that's a, that's a, a facet of, of multiple bikes in the garage that I think is, um, maybe underrated for, uh, as a benefit so. for, for riders. I think that's a, that's a great point. And I, I'm pretty, I'm an illustration of that up until 2018. I never rode any dirt. I just had basically Harleys and then I picked up a dirt bike cheap. And then now like that, that's really got out of control, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it also opened up this whole new world of like riding motorcycles in the dirt that I had quite frankly wished I had started doing years and years ago, but I would have never, I would have never had the dirt experience if I wouldn't have picked up the extra bike. You know what I mean? Cause I, I probably right, would have, right. I would have been so like, ah, I don't want to get rid of this, this, this heart, you know, my Dyna, I got to keep that cause I really like it. If I would have never picked up the other bike, I may not have had that experience. And that's a huge, it's a, you know, riding dirt has been a huge benefit, uh, just not to me personally, but like to my skill set of riding a motorcycle. It's really expanded it. So that's a really good point. Right, right. Well, do, you, do you have, I, I, um, oh, go ahead, Spurge. No, I was just saying, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you've never, you know, before buying the dirt bike, you never had the Dyna two wheels off the ground, you know, jumping it. So, I mean, <laughs> well, just very, very briefly, but like, because I think this speaks to what we're talking about, about having that that wider understanding and appreciation of motorcycles in general. What was it like the first time that both wheels came off the ground when you were out on a trail on a dirt bike? Like, what was that feeling like compared to all the other years of motorcycling you had under your belt before that? It was super weird. Like, I questioned if it happened in my mind. Did that just happen? <laughs> like, but, it, like, it was not just that, but it was, honestly, I think the biggest benefit, and I had just started getting into flat track racing, but was, like, losing, like, not having traction and then throttle control. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, like being okay with the bike sliding, not just the rear, but like like the front pushing through a corner a little bit. You know what I mean? We're on the street in a big bike. You'd have been like, oh my god. You know what I mean? Like but yeah, totally. on a dirt bike, like it just pushes through the front. You pushes through the corner a little bit, picks up traction, and the rear end wiggles, and you throttle your way out of it, and then you're just having a ball. Whereas like on the street, you don't. That's a terrible thing to happen. You know, you don't want right. to lose the front end, so you don't ever right, get right. to like figure that skill out or like, you know, throttle control with, you know, if you're, even if you're not leaving the ground, if you, you know, wheelie over something, you can really quickly get out of shape in a wheelie on like a, a little jump. So like learning that little nuance, like said, or exiting in a corner where it's slick, all the things you don't necessarily get to practice on the street or you hope you wouldn't be practicing those things <laughs> on the street. <laughs> right, so, right. you know, that's all been a huge benefit to my, like my, my skill set as far as riding a motorcycle. Have you, have you had a really acute, um, instant in your street riding life since you've been riding in the dirt that you feel like you, like you had a moment riding on the street where maybe you did lose the front in like a sandy corner. I don't know, like something yes. happened and you were kind of like, Oh, Whoa. And then you thought you reflected on why you maybe reacted differently because of the other skills that you have. Yeah, it happens quite a bit. It happened quite a bit on my 691 because you know, that bike's fun to go fast in the Canyon. Right. Yep. But here, um, in where I'm at in South Dakota, there's a lot of twisty turning and elevation changes. Well, in the winter time, they just dump sand on these roads. They plow right. them and they don't right. use ice melt. They just dump sand. Well, uh, in the, when the spring comes, I mean, the, some of the Canyon roads, especially ones that aren't really like, you know, main thoroughfares, they're just rivers of sand. I mean, like sand on the middle, sand on the middle of the lane. And then that starts to get washed, washed off, but it also washes across these corners because these corners a lot of time have a little bit of bank to them. So the water right. runs down the corner and it yeah. just leaves dirt and sand through there. So, oh yeah, like many times going through there, you know, it, it'll surprise you. The thing will just wiggle a little bit across the lane and it's not a, you know, you don't, I mean, it gets your attention, but it's not like this terrifying <laughs> thing where, I think a lot of people like, you know, will like stand, want to stand the bike up. You know what I mean? And that's right. a bad thing to do right there. You just don't have that instinct anymore of like, oh my God, stand the bike up. You, you, you keep the bike under control and get to the corner. Mm -hmm. It's, 
I wrote mm-hmm. an article uh, a couple years ago now called Tires, the <clears throat> Original Traction Control, or something like that. It's over on Common Tread. But the <laughs> article was inspired by a track day that I did with Lance. Lance came out, and we had a Z900 in the office, and we had an R6. And we just went out for a, you know, a track day down at NJMP, New Jersey Motorsports Park, uh, for those of you on the East Coast. And it was, it was my first track day that I had done where it was just, it was a deluge. I had done some like light rain track days before, but it was like, <laughs> most people didn't show up. And Lance and I showed up and it was like, well, we can go out and we can still have some fun. The, uh, you know, the, the idea was that we're not going to go race pace or anything like that, but like, we'll go out and we'll just, you know, tool around in the track. It'll be fun. And... The Z900, the stock tires, I can't remember what stock tires were on it, but they were like death tires in the rain. Like they did not have, <laughs> there was no traction. And, and the Z900, keep in mind, didn't have any fancy electronics on it. I think it might have had like traction control or ABS, maybe. I don't think it had traction control. I think it was like just ABS. It was like the first one that they brought in. And um, I, I remember going through this little chicane and the whole rear end like sliding and i remember thinking to myself like i was comfortable with like lance lance didn't believe me and then i was like why don't you come out and follow behind me on a session and just tell me like is this it feels like it's sliding on me and he we got back into the pits and he's like oh my god he was like (laughs) you were like sideways he's like how were you controlling it but it all came from I'm not by any means, like, I've seen Zach Quartz ride a motorcycle, right? Like, I'm not by any means intentionally (laughs) good at, like, backing it in. Um, But, like, you get comfortable with letting the bike move underneath you based on experience in the dirt. That's why, like, schools like American Super Camp, right? They Most of the people that go to American Super Camp, which is a flat track school, uh, aren't racing flat tracks. Some of them are, but, like, a lot of them are just looking for better understanding of controlling a motorcycle that parlays over to street riding. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. Um, you might that, that might even be a whole other podcast, everybody. You never know. You just don't <laughs> don't don't you don't you doubt it for a second. But I, I think that uh, it's going a little too far to say like, oh, just buy more motorcycles and you'll be a right. better rider. But it is there's certainly a benefit to it. Um, Definitely. And I think that we get sucked into it, the three of us, right? Because we just like bikes in general, and it's mm-hmm. easy to look at a bike and be like. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, that sounds yeah. cool. I'll have, I'll have one of those things. <laughs> um, so that's maybe how we get, uh, you know, get pulled into that scenario. But I think that's a that's a that's kind of a fun, fun breakdown of uh, of what I don't know of, of of the of the pros. Yeah, any any other ones come to mind? I have one potential more, but Patrick, any more for you before I throw mine out? No, go ahead. So for, for Spurgeon's BS one. No, this is actually one that I thought of. <laughs> I, I thought of this. I was having a conversation with our colleague Ari Henning the other day. And um, Ari Henning has a couple of bikes now that he rents out on, what's the motorcycle? Twisted Road, I think. Twisted, Twisted, Road, Twisted yeah. Road, right? Yeah. So, and, and I was thinking to myself, well, that's a, that's, you know, he specifically has this small little fleet that he uses to like rent bikes out as a bit of an extra uh, additional income. And I, I think that's a good use of like, if you are going to have a couple of bikes laying around, maybe uh-huh. you could use it to, to rent, you know, the ones that you're not using. Uh, you could you could rent out and maybe use that as a little bit of a side hustle to to bring in some some extra cash you know to pay for all the registration and insurance <laughs> fees <laughs> true 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 yeah 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 absolutely yeah well there you have it um, I think uh, I would I've been looking forward to this the the whole conversation really uh, to talk about our sort of uh, dream garage situation. Before we talk about before we talk about the right amount of motorcycles to own, in our opinion, if you could have three any three bikes in your garage, what would they be? What would your what would your sort of like dream garage, unlimited budget dream garage be? Do you have a, do you have an answer for that, Patrick? So wait, I have a I have a clarifying question. Are we? Okay. Are we it's not about the bikes that we currently have in the garage, right? We can pick any any. No, bikes. this is this is just like this is like. Uh, yeah, this is total dream garage. You can you can have any three motorcycles that you want. You can have Tom Cruise's Ninja from Top Gun and the bike from Tron and you know whatever. It doesn't matter. They don't even have to be real. <laughs> I um, it's, it's more fun if they're real, but they don't have to be. Real. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually think about this quite a bit because I need to um, cut down the number of motorcycles that I own. Uh, <laughs> 
But I think if I had to just like three types, I would go with you know a cruiser like probably my FXR um, yep. or a Dyna or some sort of you know non bagger Harley Davidson would be one of them, and then an adventure bike and then a 450 dirt bike. Um, yeah. Good the, the adventure bike, you know, it's, you can use it for so many things, but also the 450, a 450 is super versatile in that like if you wanted to like I like to flat track. I could buy a set of 19 inch wheels for it. I could lower it down. I could flat track with it. Um, even my, you know, my newfound love for supermoto in the last couple of years, throw some 17s on it, make a few changes. You know, you just run it as a dirt bike. It's a very versatile bike to have as far as, you know, like the third bike. So I think it'd be an adventure bike, uh, a 450 dirt bike, and a, a, a cruiser of some sort. I like it. Yep. Zach, what about you? Uh, I'm going, you know, I'm a city slicker. Um, so I don't, uh, don't ride in the dirt as much as you fellas do. Um, I would probably have, I would have a, like, I'd have an urban bop about, I'd probably have a scooter, probably have a little scooter of some kind that I was just talking about, you know, like a little 150cc uh, four-stroke scooter of some kind. Any specific, um, I mean, we talked about this earlier, you, you, you kind of made a, a hint about wanting to dive into that a little bit more, like any specific 150 scooter, 150 cc scooter that stands out as one that you're actually well, really excited about? Uh, the, the, that, that Honda ADD 150, I think that's the one that's mm -hmm. one I'm most hot to trot for. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do, you know, occasionally we see one of those Vespa 150s and my wife's like, Oh, that's so cute. I like that. That's a perfect impression of her, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so I sometimes, you know, like my, she, that tugs at my heartstrings and I'm like, Oh, maybe if we had one around, then she would ride it too. Cause she has her license. Um, uh, but she doesn't ride all that, all that often. So, um, that sort of like, you know, I don't know, but I, I am, I am, I'm, tickled by the idea of a Vespa, but I think I'd probably go with something a little bit more pragmatic, maybe, I'm not sure, or a little bit less expensive. We can give you an additional three for, for Kat as well, so that way, I mean, it will do... <laughs> oh, per, six per, now, yeah, because yeah. she like, has her <laughs> license. Yeah, one okay. set of three per household. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I think she'd take three Vespas. Yeah, <laughs> um, Yeah. so I think I'd do a, I'd do a little scooter, um, and then I think I would do a mid-sized adventure bike because... You know, you could, you, it would be a good city bike, like a... Something like an 890R. Like, maybe, <laughs> but probably not, just because I couldn't do that for the love of Pete. I'm thinking uh, like T7, maybe T7, um, or uh, maybe a Touareg 660 from Aprilia, but, but let's just say Yamaha T7, because uh, I think that's a fun bike to, to rage down a, 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 a dirt road or even, a, or even single track. And I'm kind of a larger rider anyway. So I feel like I would, I could kind of treat it as a dirt bike, but it'd still be good in the city. And if I wanted to take a trip, it would be reasonably comfortable. And then, uh, I'd go with a super sport, uh, like a, like a, like a mid-sized naked bike, uh, as my sort of like super sport, I think. So like, uh, maybe, sp uh, let me see here. MT-09. Mm -hmm. No, no, something racier. So super maybe Duke. like a, okay, a super Duke. Or maybe maybe a Tuono V4, just something like that. Or okay. maybe even a, a Street Triple RS, mm -hmm. uh, because something I could take to the racetrack and flog around and have a good time at a track day. Um, but also I, you know, could take it on a, 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 a twisty street ride, something like that. Um, so it might be a midsize naked bike, or maybe I would go full zoot and do a, I might do a Tuono or a Super Duke. I probably would. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. <laughs> we were so, we were so close to sharing one, but you've you've gone you've gone too big for my britches. So you're gonna go oh. you're gonna go full size, full zoot. You're going with a yeah, super yeah. duke. Okay, or so you're up, Spurge. Okay. What, what about you? No, no, no. I was just thinking. Um, so I, I'm in a I'm in a unique situation that like, if I was only able to have three bikes in the garage, I'm actually really close to the three that I would want to have. So wow, uh, my, living the dream, everybody. Yeah, it was funny. I was having this conversation recently with somebody who who listens to High Side Low Side. They're a High Side Low Side listener, and they came up to me and they're like, "What was it like when you like you know you bought a, a KTM 890 Rally, and that was kind of like what you and Zach talked about as being your dream bike?" And I was like, "It was, and it was pretty freaking <laughs> awesome to buy it." Um, the, the, making the subsequent payments on it has been a little bit less awesome, but uh, <laughs> buying it and, and taking it out and riding it. So I would say my my current 890 rally is like that's I, 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 there's nothing else out there that I want in, in that class of that riding, and that's the riding I like to do the most. So I would hold on to that. Um, I would uh, my my Bonneville T100 is still one of my favorite. You know, you talked about a bop around bike. Um, that's my bop around bike, and that's one of the. It's probably the only bike that I will never sell. Um, I don't believe in nostalgia, and I don't believe in holding on to a lot of different things. Um, 
but that's that's one that I, I probably would not let go of. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe in nostalgia, but I'm not selling that bike. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 as, as soon as I said that, I'm like, my my fiance would completely disagree because like there's so much in my in our house that like I'm like you right, can't right. sell those and you got to keep these and we got to keep them forever because like I'm gonna need those <laughs> magazines from 1988 one day. Um, so I, I realized as soon as that came out of my mouth, I'm I'm probably lying. Um, so those I would keep those two. The bike that I currently have that would go, I, I, I would probably get rid of the 350 if I'm if I could only have three, and I would say I'm going to do 890 stuff more than I'm going to do 350 stuff, and then I, I would want a uh, I would want a go fast street bike, right? So part of me was going nostalgic. Zach knows how I feel about a Honda Superhawk 996. I was like maybe a Honda Superhawk, <laughs> but frankly I don't want to take that to the track. I don't want to deal with all of that crap. Um, so I was actually between. <laughs> A uh, uh, Yamaha MT10 and a Triumph uh, Street Triple RS. So those were the yeah. two that I was kind of mm. contending with as far uh -huh. as like the street one that I was going to go with. And I, honestly, I think it's hard to beat the Triumph. As much as I really yeah. like the Yamaha, if you're going to go do a track day and you want to take something off the shelf, I, I don't know a better mid-sized naked bike than that Triumph. And even for riding it on the street, you put that thing in third gear and it's just a it's a hoot and a holla. Agreed. So, agreed, agreed. Those are my favorite. All three. right, well, th those, those are some fun dream garages. And it's a good segue, I think, too. Um, and Spurgeon sort of alluded to this, uh, but I'm very curious to what you would say, Patrick, what with having owning as many bikes as you do. What do you think is the right number? Like, what do you think, if someone said you have to pick a number of bikes, you don't have to pick the bikes that they will be, mm -hmm. but you have to pick a number of bikes that you would like to own for the next, whatever, 20 years. What's. What's the what's the what's the ideal number in your mind? Yeah, it's a good question, and also I've been thinking about it. Like I said, because I need to cut down to some things. The problem <laughs> so is so less the, less than ten. Then less or? than ten is definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but like Spurgeon said, it's kind of the nostalgia of some things. Like that, that that Suzuki is very nostalgic. You know, that there's a long story there, but it's a nostalgic bike. And the other thing is, like, I am a sucker for like a project guy. You know what I mean? Like. Oh, I could make that into this. So I get kind of, you know, that's how I accumulate some things. But I, honestly, I think probably four, if I'm being perfectly honest, because the three number is okay. good. But there was like, also, there's a couple of things, you know, when you guys were talking about like, <laughs> oh, maybe you own a scooter or like a go fast street bike. You know, I kind of hemmed myself in there. I don't want to give up those three. Right. But it would also be nice to have, you know, like that street triple or something like that in the garage right, too. Right. So I think I think four for me would be where it was at. Like the three they talked about with the cruiser, the you know, the eight ninety and the dirt bike, but also having the ability to like shuffle through a fast street bike or maybe I want a scooter or something else. Like I think four is is and you know you can pretty easily put that all out in a two car garage, even with like my tools and that. Like I can fit four bikes in there. No problem. Yeah. I don't have to have extra storage. Yeah, as long as your shape. wife's car is out on the street, you're good. So yeah. <laughs> I have to, so we have a deal and I have to be able to put her car in the garage like within minutes if I, cause there's hail in South Dakota. So that's really where it comes from or wow. snow. So she's like, look, gotcha. you can park stuff here, but you better be able to wiggle that stuff around like immediately. So I do, I can't, I can, I can shuffle my bikes I have in my garage over to one side and pull her car in like in a moment's notice. So that, that's the deal that we have. <laughs> and I think I can still do that with four. So okay. I'm, I'm going with four. So four is the answer. Okay. What about you, Spurge? I disagree. I don't think four is enough. I don't four's think I don't enough. think four is enough. No, okay. I okay. Interesting. Five, five is my number. Um, okay, and it's adventure bike, sporty bike, uh, around town, bop about. I don't realistically want to give up my dirt bike, so I, I want a pure <laughs> dirt machine in there. And then the fifth one really comes into like the the random bike, right? Like, and I say that because the random bike is something different for a little bit, uh, for, for different people. But like, for me, it would be something vintage, perhaps it would be something that is, you know, it would pretty, it would to be a very nostalgic, uh, Bonneville. No, no, the Bonneville, the Bonneville is the around town bop about, or in, oh, in this, in this case, it could be that, you know, it could be that, but I would say the, the, the fifth one is more of like, I, I would love to have a really nice, clean, uh, vintage, triumph right that only goes out on sunday afternoons in the fall uh <laughs> before the salt is on the ground and you know before the winter comes or a, a, you know a, an old norton commando or you know something that yeah, is is just you know it's it doesn't have to run all the time 
you're going to have to put some time and effort into it. It's going to be a hundred mile ride on a Sunday morning, you know, with some friends, and and that's the only use for that fifth, uh, you know, bike. So I guess to me, that's that's kind of where I don't want to give up the dirt bike. I want to bring that back into what my three were, right. um, <clears throat> but then I, I want that fifth one in there. So I'm going to go with right. five. And right, I didn't. Right, right. I didn't have the conversation with Patrick. Did I? I told my my. Uh, I told Nicole that if we, if we end up, um, you know, getting a bigger house, that she has no say in the garage and no claim to the garage. <laughs> that she can pick whatever she wants in the house. I will pick what I want in a garage, and then she has no bays. She will leave her car in the driveway. So, okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's a hard line being drawn. Yeah, this, this this tough. I was listening to you guys. I was deferring because I didn't actually know what I what I was gonna say, and and I don't. I think. I don't know. My my instinct is four also because I named the three that I wanted my dream garage, but I am kind of nostalgic and I do think I would keep my KTM. And it's just not a super useful bike, realistically. It's good. It's it's fun. It's a fun round town bike in a city and it's a fun twisty road bike. It's like it's a good bike in general, but like you don't you don't. I'm not going to ride it in the dirt much. It's not going to be that much fun. Mm-mm. And it's not going to be as useful to to bop around as like a scooter or something like that. But I don't want to get rid of it. So I think I think it would be my bike and then the th- and then the three that I mentioned. So the, you're you're going with four too. Yeah, although although I do have my little CRF50 also. Does that count as a bike? It does. So like it's it's like a third of a bike. And you also don't have a pure <laughs> dirt bike. So you you're not going dirt biking with the rest of us. Do you want to be left I'm taking out? my T7. I've seen you ride. You'll never touch Patrick Garvin on his 450R. It's not possible. <laughs> okay. Well, he's not my possible. friend, so maybe he'll wait for me. I don't know. I don't know. I think he's going to um, just blow your doors off. He's you're just going to leave me. You're going to take one to die in the South Dakota this, Hills. This is, is going to be this is going to be like the time that Patrick Garvin came and rode with me when I had an 890, and then he had to go out and buy one. You're going to go on one ride with him on a 450, and you're going to be like, you know what I need? I need a dirt bike. I need a 450. Uh, I want to be like Patrick. Yep. Maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So maybe, maybe five is the answer. Maybe six. So maybe it, ten. Who knows? In closing for the topic, before we jump into our brand new for season six engine game, yes. uh, are there any closing tips of of uh, our nuggets of wisdom, Patrick? Starting with you specifically, that you want to lay on someone who might currently own one motorcycle and is thinking about possibly getting two, three, four. Five, maybe more. <laughs> what would what would what would be what would be a tip that you would want to impart on someone uh, that is thinking about owning multiple motorcycles? Yeah, I, my, the biggest thing for me is the but the aftermarket budget, right? Like it's pretty easy when you have one bike, like oh I'm gonna put an exhaust on this or do this or that, and but when you have multiples, especially when something breaks. Like I wasn't planning on buying a set of wheels for my 450. I had we had the 250 project, and I had things I needed to buy for that, and then I broke a wheel, and like, so they're just the budget for the parts you're going to have to throw, especially if it's something like a dirt bike or an adventure bike, where there's going to be significant wear and tear and things that just get consumed. Um, I would put a lot of thought into that, you know what I mean, and kind of like what your plans are going to be for the bike, you know down the road and how, how you want to like outfit that machine and how that affects the other things you own because it basically you know it, it doubles the cost of your aftermarket if you if you're the type of person that wants to put a slip on everything you own well now you're buying more than one for sure so i think i would think about that and then you know i think storage probably everybody's going to think about that where i'm going to put it but storage and then <laughs> like the 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 aftermarket part of it like and you know and, and consumables that that it's going to eat Hmm? Yeah, fair enough. What about you, Spurge? No, what about you, Zach? You go ahead. Oh, me, okay. Um, My advice on buying another motorcycle would be be deliberate about why you're getting it. If you have, if you already have a bike that's like an old cafe racer and it was your first bike and it's a project and you're always tinkering with it, then if you get another bike, ask yourself why. Don't, I, and I, and I would say don't buy another project, right? Like get another bike because, oh, cool, it's a, uh, whatever it's a it's a um it's a triumph speed triple that i bought used from 2013 and like it's in good shape and doesn't have very very many miles on it and i'm going to use that as like my daily rider and then i'm going to keep on tinkering with my old cafe racer or vice versa you have a a daily rider that's good doesn't have much maintenance it's a it's a whatever it is and then you're like well i want a project i want to fiddle with something i want to tinker that's all good i'd say just like be deliberate about why you're getting that other bike is it 
and 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 have have a good reason that you feel like you can fall back on and and it will you know diversify your motorcycling experience uh in more ways than one rather than just having another of the same thing that you already have whether it's a project or or just another money pit or whatever yeah i think i think those are both great and i think you know to take patrick's one one step farther for mine it would just be really consider the actual cost of it right and i'm not talking about you know adding aftermarket parts and i'm not talking about um you know whether or not you're going to rebuild something i'm talking about like what is the actual cost of of ownership of this think about all the different associated costs that are going to come into play um in, in addition to whatever the msrp is that you're paying for that bike and then within that there's opportunity costs, right? There's things that you're not going to be able to do or not be able to buy because you now have multiple motorcycles. And and I'm only saying that because <laughs> because like you got to really want it, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I think I think there's a difference between someone that is a motorcycle rider because they're you know a, they're a casual enthusiast that likes you know maybe going back and forth to the office or going out for a Sunday ride, and, and someone that wants to really spend a lot of time you know, working on riding and, and maintaining and owning motorcycle that, yep, yep. you know, it's, it, it requires a conversation <clears throat> with loved ones at times and some understanding from loved ones because it becomes pretty, <laughs> pretty big, pretty quick. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Well, I like to think that, uh, anyone thinking about considering, or even people that already own multiple motorcycles would have gotten a kick out of that. And I'm just too excited not to move on. Is it okay if we, if we move on to the, to the engine sound game, Spurge? Zach, you've been waiting for this all oh, last season. So when we, first, <laughs> when we first teased it to the audience, we talked about we were going to bring this in for season six. So Zach, lay it on us. What is this game all about? How is it going to work? So you can play along at home. Um, it'll, uh, it'll only take a few minutes, I promise. Um, we're going to play a sound, an engine running, a motorcycle engine running, and we're going to try and guess what it is. Uh, producer Chase has sourced this one. Um, we don't know what it is, uh, any of us. Um, we will, of course, give guest honors to Mr. Patrick Garvin um, uh, to, to make his first guess. There'll be some hints involved if we can't get it right, um, and we will uh, work our way through this process and try and figure out what this bike is. And uh, hopefully you all at home uh, <laughs> will be shouting out loud in your living room or in your car, or wherever you're listening, and saying what idiots we are that we can't get it right. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, and then at the end, we will solicit more engine sounds from, from you all. But for now, <laughs> let's listen to this engine sound. Everybody take a minute. Um, you, you listening to the podcast, the three of us here, we're going to listen to this sound and see if we can figure it out. Well, we're going to let Patrick take the first guess on that, but I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb and say this sounds like something that's right in your wheelhouse, Patrick. <laughs> I, I think I, I know what country it's made in. So let's just put it that yeah. way. So I'm going to try to be as specific as I can. So this is this is a Harley engine, but I'm going to give you some specifics that I think. I think it's definitely carbureted. Nice. Um, I, I'm it, it sounds I think it's a shovel head. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's, shovel head. So, I, so give so sorry, just really quick, give mm -hmm. people some some uh, background on shovel head. What what's the era for shovel head Harley's? Yeah, like uh, 60s, 70s. Okay, pre Evo, so they ran up into '84, and then okay. I believe they first year was like '66, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it's okay. Uh, so it's you know kind of like the quintessential chopper engine. Um, also, probably the worst engine ever produced by Harley Davidson, <laughs> as far as reliability. It sounds <laughs> it it sounds very like it sounds like a heavy flywheel. Like the the rev very, is very slow. Extremely heavy flywheel. Okay. Um, also, I think I would, just listening to the exhaust tone, I it almost sounds like it has a set of fishtail exhaust on it. It does. So, I agree. Yeah, so I think shovel head. You know, obviously there are no fuel injected shovel heads. Uh, so carbureted shovel head. Fishtail exhaust. I'm going to be as specific as I can. So uh, <laughs> okay. I. So that's that's yeah, that's incredible. Go ahead, Spurge. No, I was going to say we can. So you you you. 
nailed the engine. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Zach, I'm, I'm not even. I'm not even give Zach and I a chance to play because you 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 guessed on that, and the two of you were going back and forth. But now what I want to do because this is this is one that we actually sourced specifically for you, according to our producer Chase. And I cheated, and as soon as you you kind of guessed, I, I I did look. But I want to see if we can get you specific. I want to see if you can figure out exactly what bike this is because we sourced it from one of your friends. So this, I'm going to give you both hints and I'm going to see if you can actually figure out which bike this is, okay? Okay. So hint number one is that it's a rat bike with a jammer Springer front end. <laughs> that's, that's, first of all, exactly what, Patrick said, I mean, the, he, you said it, uh, you said the, the quintessential chopper engine, right? So this is yeah. like 60s, 70s rat bike Springer front end chopper, right? I mean, that's right in your, the same wheelhouse that you said. Jammer, yeah, jam, a jammer, for whatever that means, Patrick, this sounds like it means more to yeah. you than it does to me, but it's I, a jammer <laughs> Springer front end. Uh, I guess it's, it's, it's Shovelhead Sasha's bike. Um, I don't know which one of his because he's got a handful of them down there. But it's it's Sasha's bike. I, I, I'm I'm pretty sure of it. So hint, yeah, hint number two was that the engine sound was provided by Sasha Haltea uh, yeah, that, of Sasha's Cycle of Sturgis. That's yep, that's him. That's what and, it is. And it is a 1966 Harley Davidson shovelhead. Does it have fishtail exhaust? Yes. He, it doesn't say. It, it didn't say that. <laughs> my nose. Like, you, but Patrick knows the bike. Yeah, I'm positive it does. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> an, FL, yeah. an FLH hardtail rat bike with a jammer Springer front end, and it's a fun it's a fun one to rip on and go. Yeah, I know the exact <laughs> bike. It does it, it it yep, that's the exhaust. There you go. Yeah. Well <laughs> the, the, I, I, I mean I'm yes. gonna, dude. The fact the fact that you were like knuckle or a shovel head nineteen sixty six, like I will give it to you there, buddy. Um, that was probably better than I would have been able to even come close to doing. So kudos I to you. I thought it was older. I thought it was going to be like an uh, it was uh, old like even older than that just like the 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 way it revved up so slow like that it sounded like it was like a post war bike or something you know so you know like, what's funny is panheads have, have a to me anyway have a very specific sound they don't sound like anything else and panhead was before shovelhead and even mm -hmm. they used the in the early shovelheads were basically panheads with different cylinder heads on them okay. and so same heavy flywheel but they have a different exhaust note because the cylinder heads a little bit different right. and so like. I think I would have been able to tell that too, but the pan head to me would have sounded a little bit different than that. And that right. is just that, that I think the shovel head really kind of like, you know, Harley, didn't they try to patent their sound or they did patent their sound? Like, yeah, something that, like that. That's yeah. the sound that is like the quintessential like chopper Harley sound. And obviously I've, I've heard quite a few. So that one, it was not difficult for me to kind of pinpoint. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, you set I the bar impressed. very high for yeah. the for the engine guessing game. That is for sure, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so was, for all for all fun. for all the future guests, they're going to have to live up to the bar in which you set. So let's just go on record as far as season six, episode one, the very first episode of the game. Uh, Patrick, you get a gold star. You came out of the <laughs> came out of the gate swinging. So what we what what Zach and I do want to ask our guests that are listening to the podcast. Um, uh, not our guests, but the, our listeners that are uh, you know with us today on the podcast, please take some time. If you think that you can stump Zach or myself or a guest, we want to source these engine sounds from you, from the audience. Uh, so please feel free to shoot us an email. Shoot our producer, Chase, an email. Zach and I will not open these emails. Uh, these will go to producer, Chase. So when you're, when you're filling out the subject line, uh, put engine sound guessing game in the subject line of your email. Please provide the year, make, model, and any mods that have been done to your motorcycle. And then we just need an audio clip of your bike. So we need a 20 to 30 second audio clip of your bike idling. Give it a couple of revs. You don't have to use any fancy audio equipment. Your, your smartphone will do. And then you want to shoot that in an email over to highside, lowside at revzilla.com. And uh, as long as you make sure you have engine sound guessing game in the subject line, <laughs> Producer Chase is our only person that's going to open that up. Right. And if we choose your engine, uh, we'll send you a T-shirt. By gosh. I'm pretty sure Chase said that's what uh, we oh, were going to do. People love T-shirts. <laughs> so, so we're going to send him a T-shirt. Uh, 
so uh, that that concludes our um, uh, your guest appearance on High Side Low Side Season Six Episode One. Patrick Garvin, you've been a delight as always. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for setting the bar so gosh darn high for the for the engine guessing game. That was fun. Um, and uh, unless you have any final uh, insights for the viewers and listeners, we can uh, we can let you go. No, it's fun as always. Like I said, anytime you guys want to talk about motorcycles, that's literally my favorite thing to talk about. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's always fun. Right on. All right. Well, we will see you again, I'm sure, in season six, Patrick. But for now, we're going to go uh, address some comments and some T-shirt winners. So we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Later, man. Okie doke, everybody. There goes Patrick Garvin, uh, the gentleman among gentlemen, as always. Um, very impressive engine guessing skills. I, I didn't see that coming. I mean, I guess I should have seen it coming. He knows very, his very impressive Austrian motorcycle ownership. If I'm being honest, yeah. yeah. Well, there's that too. Speaking of world maps, did, what'd you uh, what'd you come up with with Kazakhstan? Tell the people with Kazakhstan ah. a part of the Soviet Union or not? For those of you that have been on the edge of your seat this entire podcast, uh, Kazakhstan was originally part of the Soviet Union, uh, gained their independence from the Soviet Union in 1991. And my only there point in even bringing that up was <laughs> the fact that, you know, you know, Ural started as a brand under the Soviet Union. And so, you know, it's not that they're leaving, you know, I, I think they're identified as a Russian brand, but for right. the most part, like they're kind of, they're kind of keeping it in the family Going right. to Kazakhstan, so they're still Soviet. Hashtag still Soviet. Let's get it trending on, <laughs> on social media. I don't know All how right. the Kazakhstanian people would feel about that, but yeah, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Um, Hashtag All right. Well, Soviet. the time has come um, to give away a T-shirt. The way that you can win a T-shirt, as a friendly reminder, is to go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for High Side, Low Side. We so appreciate that. It helps people find the show, and it helps keep us as relevant as we could ever hope to be. Um, and uh, the winner this time, Spurge, drum roll. <laughs> the winner this time is Kona St. Uh, Kona ST wrote in and said, uh, I've read Common Tread since taking an interest in motorcycles, but kept putting off my riding for one reason or another. Uh, started watching Daily Rider, uh, tip of the camp, Daily Rider, uh, over and over, um, and it finally pushed me over the edge. I told myself, if I don't start, start riding soon, I never will. Kona ST then took an MSF riding course, picked up a bike, a 2012 Bonneville SE, um, a choice inspired in large part by Spurgeous Bonneville stories, both in the podcast and on Common Tread. So, Kona ST has been reading Common Tread for years now, has been working up to the motorcycle thing, started watching Daily Rider, read Spurgeon's Bonneville stories, took an MSF course, dove into two wheels. We love these stories. Um, we hope that you're having fun uh, in your new two-wheeled world, Kona ST. And to help you uh, alienate yourself from any other motorcyclist, we will send you a high side, low side t-shirt in whatever size you please. Just send us uh, your mailing address and your preferred size to high side, low side at revzilla.com. I'll throw an extra little fun quiz out to the audience, and I'll give you the answer next time. And I'm just making this <laughs> up as we go along, because we're doing games in Season 6, apparently. Uh, if you know the year that Common Tread was founded, oh, shoot us an email at the high side, low side at revzilla.com <laughs> and uh, give us your answer. Quizzes. But I will tell you that if you just go back and look for the earliest article published, that is not the correct date. So uh, you can't really, oh, you can't cheat on this one. You actually have I to see. know. Yep. Interesting, so, interesting, interesting. Yep, All yep. right. Well, I didn't know you could just make up quizzes in the middle of the podcast, but that is a fun nuance to season six. Thanks, Burge, for that. Yeah. Um, I hope to see uh, more of these from you next time as we get into episode two. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I, I guess I'm not pulling my weight. All right. Um, Thank you so much, Kona ST, for your review, and uh, we hope you take us up on that T-shirt. So shoot us uh, an email when you can. Um, uh, Spurge, take us into the uh, viewer-listener comments, why don't you? Yeah, so the high side, low side comments come from emails that you have sent us with suggestions and critiques. They also come from the <laughs> comments section of the YouTube experience. For those of you that do watch on the old YouTubes, the first comment today uh, is from Leander. Uh, this was an email, and Leander says, Greetings, Zach and Spurge, from a Dutch listener. I recently bought a 2016 Honda Africa Twin, and I love it. I ride with a small group, and they have, in no <laughs> particular order, a Ducati Hyperstrata 950 SP, a 
950RVE. What's that? You know, we know what that know. is? I'm assuming that's another Ducati, possibly, of a 950RVE. <laughs> uh, anyway, a Duke 790 as well as a Speed Triple from Triumph. So a KTM Duke 790 uh, and a Speed Triple, all are very sporty motorcycles for yeah, those so of you listening. Like sporty naked yeah. bikes of one ilk or another, sort of like yeah. the Hyper is a Motard kind of thing. But yeah, basically like sporty naked bikes, it sounds like. Leander goes on to say, because I'm 26 and the youngest of the group, they joke about my choice of adventure bike. They really like the Africa Twin, but still, there's a common stigma. Why do you think adventure bikes have an old, and he put this in, in quotes, an old fart reputation? And <laughs> do you think it's changing because of bikes like the T7, Desert X, Torig, etc.? Zach, what do you think? Well, the reason that adventure bikes have an old fart reputation, to answer your question, is that they're sensible, and they're comfortable, and they're reasonable. That's why. This, this is like a... The, in, in some ways, they're like the um, they're they're like the the Velcro sneakers of the of the motorcycling world. You know, like if people, it's it's easy to look at them and be like, yeah, they're kind of, they're kind of dorky. But if you, I've never, I I don't have a lot of Velcro sneaker experience. But I assume if I were to use one, I'd be like, I get it, kind of convenient. You know, no laces to worry about. So I think that the the reason is obvious. Like the people that the demographic that typically buy that kind of bike are older because they've gotten to the point where they're like, well, I just want horsepower and I want comfort and I want luggage and I want heated grips. Ipso facto, I'm going with one of these bikes. And uh, you know, it's not the like, it's not the the cool 26 year old like you are, Lander, that necessarily <laughs> buys that bike historically. So that's why the reputation exists. Um, as for whether or not that's changing. I don't know. What do you think, Spurge? I don't. I, I, I don't think really it. Think I so. think it is changing. Oh, I oh, disagree. Yeah, yeah okay. I think it's changing 100. percent and, and I see this with the younger demographic. You know, even with some of the the younger folks that we've seen at the last couple of adventure events that that we've thrown, some of the adventure events that I go to. Um, you know, and I actually wrote an article about this recently for the first issue of Common Tread, where I talked about getting into adventure riding and how when I was in my 20s, uh, much like Leander is now. I had my Bonneville and I was into sport bikes and cafe uh -huh, racers uh -huh. and all that jazz. And my dad came home with a Suzuki V-Strom and I was like, old man bike. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, like, that's not my kind of riding. <laughs> and then I started riding his bike and I was like, this thing's actually kind of a lot of fun. I mean, from a power yeah. standpoint, like this bike right. is hauling the mail, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and then when I started getting into adventure riding, I was probably in my early 30s. And it was about like, I, I want to get out and I want to challenge myself and I want to, you know, really use this thing off road and I want to get more into off road riding. And the adventure bike um, was the perfect mix of the two because I couldn't at the time afford a, a dedicated dirt bike. And, and this kind of parlays into our episode today, but I could only afford one motorcycle. And that's where the adventure bike came to play, where I could ride to the trails, I could ride the trails, and then I could ride home from the trails. Uh, yeah, so it, it became something that was Sensible. a lot more fun. And I think now we are seeing a younger demographic get involved because I, as I will admit says, that actually get on adventure fest, especially like you see, you see a fair number of uh, 20 somethings and 30 somethings that, that like to have an ADV bike and, and like rage it off road and ride it hard. And, and that, they, there's a whiff of uh, of cool about them. They're not old farts, right? Yeah, there is a there is a bit of a difference sometimes. I think in demographics where uh, where some of the the maybe plus fifty crowd or plus sixty crowd is using their <laughs> adventure bikes a bit more. Uh, sensibly in and they're touring with them they're oh, might, maybe they're handling capacity a, right yeah right. maybe a fire yeah. road or a dirt road but they're not raging on them and then um you have people like myself that doesn't that we don't really consider it a successful event unless you have to replace <laughs> something when you come home you know um and i think there's an in-between there and then there's always exceptions to the rules but i would say overall uh leander be proud of your africa twin yeah it's an amazing motorcycle uh and i you are right. There is definitely a younger demographic getting into this. And frankly, you're leading the charge. You're part of that younger demographic. So be proud. Wave that Africa Twin flag uh, widely. And while we were talking, Zach, just so you know, producer Chase pulled up a picture. The 950 RVE that oh. uh, Leander was speaking of is actually right. a, a special edition version of the Hyper Motard. So we, I, we, I we looked were it correct. up as well. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I see that. We uh, Shame on us for not knowing the, the special edition Ducati version. Anyway. The Italians uh, would be disappointed. Uh, certainly. Um, 
But yeah, like like Spurge said, Leander, you're on the bleeding edge of of what's cool, I suppose, being a 26 year old with an Africa twin, and I think you should uh, proudly. Uh, ride with your, your friends there. And, you know, maybe maybe you'll take a ribbon, but that's okay. Yeah, and then find a dirt road, and when all of your friends stop yeah, and tremble exactly. in fear, you rip down it like a maniac. The maniac <laughs> that we know you are. Right. All right. Our second uh, comment question um, comes via email, also from a 26-year-old European. Um, this comes from Arne in Austria. Oh, and he's a student from Germany. Excuse me. Um, and Guten Tag. Uh, Guten Tag, says Arne. I hope I'm saying your name right, Arne. Arne wanted to take uh, our minds to a recently published change in the law of Austria. Um, they plan or already they plan to or already have a new law in action which puts popping a wheelie uh, uh, under a fine of about ten thousand um, dollars. Plus, your motorcycle gets confiscated. For three days, you'd Arnie be wants f- to know, Zach. What? Like <laughs> you, like you'd be bankrupt in a in a week, my friend. Oh. Well, I, you know, suppose I get caught, I would be. I suppose. Should we tell just, the high just, side? Should we tell the high side? Low, low side or the 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 story about when we were out in Mojave and you popped a wheelie in front of the police officer while we were going on the highway together, and I was trying to take your photo, and we tried. I didn't. I didn't pop a wheelie in front of a police officer. The you police railed officer down the highway at 80 miles an hour on one wheel. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to have fun with my friend Spurge. Yeah. So what do you think of this? What do you think of this law? Is this draconian Spurge to, to $10,000 and, and a, your bike gets confiscated for, for popping a wheelie? What, what, what are your thoughts? I, so uh, I think this is bananas right now. What I think they're trying to do is they're trying to cut down on reckless riding. But what I don't right, think right. this takes into account, and this is arguably an entirely other podcast, is the fact that, like, if you uh, – let's let's use Zach Quartz as an example. I, <laughs> I, I, would trust, I would trust Zach Quartz next to me on the highway doing a wheelie at 80 – and be comfortable riding within feet of him, knowing that he is in control, then I would be riding next to somebody texting on a phone or even somebody that just is uncomfortable riding because they don't have the appropriate skill set yet. So I don't think that by saying we're going to identify people that do wheelies as dangerous, I think is a pretty blanket statement. And it doesn't speak to the skill involved um, that some riders have to be able to to perform mm-hmm. such wheelies. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, and the laws have to be general, right? You know, there has to be a, like a blanket thing that applies to everybody. So like, um, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. And I can see him wanting to crack down you know, if there was, especially if there was a specific problem with that, 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 that Austria has had with like people doing wheelies and, and causing disruptions in society, then I, I, you know, I don't know, maybe there's a reason behind it. The thing that gets me, so the, the, um, the article that we ended up uh, referencing um, for this was from uh, Motorrad in Germany. And I think that article says, I just pulled up here, wheelies, stoppies, and other driving maneuvers in the future. Well, hmm. th- those are the things. So it includes stoppies. And I only bring that up because I had a situation in my neighborhood last year sometime. I was riding my KTM. I went, uh, I did an errand of some kind. I don't remember. Um, I came back through the neighborhood and I was going through a uh, one of these... Uh, it's just an intersection in my neighbor in my suburban neighborhood where one road crosses another and one road has a stop sign and the other does not. And I was on the road that did not have a stop sign. Um, and there was a car in front of me and the car in front of me turned right down the road that we were intersecting and then whipped the wheel to the left to do a U-turn across Ooh. the lane in front of me. And I, jammed on the brakes because I didn't realize that that was happening. And in doing so, I did a, I did a stoppy. And once I realized, if I'm being honest, once I realized that I was going to stop in time and it was okay, I may have exaggerated the stoppy a little bit. So <laughs> the person looked over and were, they were a little bit freaked out because frankly, I wanted them to be freaked out. Like you almost hit a motorcycle, you yeah. know? And if someone wasn't as, if it wasn't paying attention as, as, as closely as I was, or if they were going faster than I was going, like it could have been a bad situation. Um, but I, I imagine that situation and then a police officer being like, well, you did a stoppy. And I'm like, what? someone pulled out in front of me and my bike doesn't have ABS and I was just stopping and I did that thing. And it feels like that's the kind of thing that you could 
get in trouble for when I don't think that would be a deserving. I know it's a very specific scenario. No, but All I'm I, saying is with these generalist laws, sometimes then the interpretation comes into it. And then, and then like you said, Spurge, there isn't a, it's not, it turn, it's, it's not common sense anymore. Yeah. I think some of these issues, I think some of these issues aren't black and white. And when they try to create laws right. like this, I mean, this, this smells very heavily of them trying to go after a very specific demographic in motorcycling. And they're trying to create a law that right. makes it possible for them to really penalize a, a specific type of urban rider. Um, and, and that's what I'm guessing is happening here, more right. so than, you know, you bringing the groceries home and, and you know, jamming on the front brake. But right. it concerns well, me even more that it goes on that it's not just about wheelies, that there's other maneuvers other that can maneuvers. be other maneuvers. <laughs> exactly. Zach and I are both using air quotes when we say <laughs> maneuvers um, that, that could be, you know, roped into this. So that makes me even right. more uncomfortable. What I like to think, I'm going to put a positive spin on this. That KTM like is going to think, come to the rescue and they're going <laughs> to partition the Austrian government to, you know, right. get rid of this? Not The issue is not black and white. The issue is black and orange. <laughs> I'm Spurgeon Dunbar and I'm on the ballot for 2022. <laughs> So what I'd like to think, to put a positive spin on this, I like to think that the Austrian government puts this in place as a threat for doing dangerous maneuvers uh, among society. And if a police officer sees a group of people riding their, their, their sport bikes or their naked bikes, adventure bikes in the mountains somewhere, and they're all wearing gear and it's a nice day and they're having fun. And one of them comes out of a corner and pops little wheelie, the police officer or, you know, th th this imaginary uh, uh, government official will think, eh, this, this is okay. This is okay. But if someone's like doing wheelies around town where kids are on the sidewalk and moms with their strollers and stuff like that, then they will be able to bring the full force to the law and say, this is unacceptable behavior. Because as much as I love wheelies, there's a time and place. And not every place and time is the time and place, if you know what I mean. I agree with that. I agree with that. And, yeah. and if nothing else, historically speaking, the Austrian government has been nothing if not uh, diplomatic in their actions. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not I, sure. I, <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that. But, uh, anywho, uh, before we get embroiled in a geopolitical <laughs> debate and controversy here on our We've already talked about Russia today, the Soviet know, Union. I mean, it's really a Good global Lord. political episode. So Now, the thing about the sound of music... <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, those are great. Those are great questions and comments from our 26 year old European listeners and viewers. Thank you so much uh, for learning English and then sending us those Emails. great questions. Um, uh, that was that was a lot of fun. And so remember and, uh, to leave us leave us leave us YouTube comments. Please, please shoot do, us yes. shoot us an email to high side low side. Most of you we're we're hitting a point where most of you are actually listening to this as a podcast, which is exactly as Zach and I attended. We're very excited to see how the <laughs> high side low side podcast platform has grown. So if you're listening, shoot us an email to high side low side at revzilla.com. Remember, shoot us those engine sounds. The yes. sounds, not the sounds of music, the sounds of engines are what we <laughs> want to hear here at High Side Low Side. The year, the make, the model, any modifications you've done, and in the uh, in the subject line, you want to put engine sound game. So, mm -hmm. Zach, with that, what have we learned today? We're gonna we're gonna do a roundup here. What have we learned today? Well, uh, let's see here. The end of season six, episode one. My takeaway that we just sort of blew right by is that Spurgeon Dunbar got engaged. Hey, this guy. All right. I did. That's uh, that's congratulations, my friend. Some, some said it would never happen. And I, I was found, one of those people. Yeah. I, I found a very tolerant <laughs> and loving woman who puts up with all of the, the shenanigans that, uh, mm. that, you and, know, entails. And, and in turn, the, I, I maintain her motorcycle for her. That you do. That you do. And you only rarely make fun of her on your, on your podcast. So yeah, that's my, <laughs> that's my, my one little takeaway from this, from this episode. You got one? I think that if you are interested in owning multiple motorcycles, you should give it a shot. I, I think as someone that has owned multiple motorcycles for a, a couple years now, uh, it's worth the sacrifice that comes in other areas because it's it's cool to have more than more than one sheep in the flock, if you will. Okay, there you go. Yeah. One sheep does not a flock make. Nine. <laughs> there you have it, everybody. That's the that's the big uh, takeaway from episode one of this uh, of this kickoff to. 
season six. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. We hope you had fun. Um, and we will see you next time on High Side, Low Side. Thank you.